Hello, welcome to this New Space NYC meeting. Um, my name is David Bullock. Um, I'm a space and science writer. Um, I am here for this meeting to um, talk about my book that just came out in December, um, and also a children's book that came out in August. Um, it's my first, each of them are my first for each genre. Um, and uh, I first want to thank people from New, New Space MYC for allowing me to co-host this meeting with them. Um, I want to thank um, Bobby O'Brien and um, my father, James T. Bullock, for letting me use this space. Otherwise, um, we wouldn't be able to, to be here or to broadcast. Um, and uh, what I'm going to do at first is, um, is read from the book um, that I wrote. I'm going to read a chapter. Um, it's basic book reading. Um, and then I'm going to open the floor for questions. Um, I usually don't take questions. I'm usually the person who asks questions. And I try to keep that, like, if you know me, who know me from coming to these new space meetings, I usually don't talk that much and just ask a lot. If I, not a lot, a little, but, but like, but like try to, to take as much information in as I possibly can. But this time it's all about you, you know, giving it to me, so to speak. And you could press hard. So, um, okay. This is 2000, 2018, a new space primer. Um, it, like I said, it came out in December. Um, uh, there are seven chapters to it. Um, and I interviewed, for the book, I interviewed, uh, I think it was around 11 people um, for the content. Um, it's sort of written magazine style, um, which is the style I'm used to. It's not written academically, there's no footnotes or, or anything of that nature. Um, and uh, I was able to have Chuck Black, a, a fellow space writer from Canada, um, write my forward. Um, he's someone that I knew from working with New Space Global, which is a company I work for now. Um, I started working for them as a writer. Uh, I'm now an analyst slash salesperson. So um, I'll probably will be talking about New Space Global a little too. Um, they um, are a business intelligence company on New Space, and they focus solely on New Space. Um, so they have very few competitors. Um, and um, they're offering subscriptions now to um, their information for both institutions and individuals. Um, but I'm going to read um, the introduction, which is on page 15. And that should give you somewhat of an idea of the book. So um, I'll start now. So the concept of new space probably reached its nascent height in 2004, when Bert Rutan and the recently deceased Paul Allen of Mojave Aerospace Ventures won the Anasari X Prize Cup on November 6th. The focus then was to get humans into suborbital space, and the two teammates did this twice with their historical spacecraft, Spaceship One. The competition succeeded in having the first non-governmental attempt to reach, at reaching space. However, this victory was just the start of what would bring hundreds of comp companies to enter the privately held commercial space industry over the last 10 years, 2008 to 2018. These emerging commercial space ventures have formed an industry more commonly called new space and are waking up, to the, waking up the world to opportunities driven by the edge of technolo technological achievement. It may even be a new arena to make a good dollar or two. While the Spaceship One victory was a precursor to the last 10 years, the defining moment for these, for these last 10 years was even more recent. What makes it different from the suborbital launch of Spaceship One is that it's about an orbital launch, and it also redefines re reusability. Thomas Andrew Olson, founder and chair of the Center for Space Commerce and Finance, felt that February 6, 2018, when Elon Musk's company, Space Exploration Technologies, or simply SpaceX, launched a Falcon Heavy rocket and landed both booth boosters, which had detached from the size of, two, of the two-stage rocket at the same time, was a defining moment of our century. Even though the launch was a test flight, the Falcon Heavy was probably the most powerful launch vehicle at that time. However, having reusable parts are important because in cer certain cases, it could cut costs. 
but like Spaceship One was a standalone reusable spacecraft that only needed refueling, and parts of SpaceX rockets are reusable for future launches, reusability has been a theme for the past 20 years, explained Clark Lindsay, former managing editor of New Space Global's New Space Watch and owner of HobbySpace.com. Outside reusability, the years of 2008 to 2018 had many other new space accomplishments. While the Ansari X Prize defined the year on and before 2004, the Google Lunar X Prize continued the advancement of space by the X Prize organization. The, Gunner, the Google Lunar X Prize had teams across the globe compete, and send, compete to send a rover to the moon that travels for a time on its surface and takes high resolution pictures to be sent back to Earth. The cl contest closed, however, after no team claimed the prize within the given time frame. Michael Paul, who currently works at the John Hopkins Institute for Applied Physics Laboratory and is the former leader of the Penn State Google Lunar X Prize <coughs> team, the Lunar Lions, said, and around 2008, things started to look up more from the new space perspective, more dynamic, more risk tolerant level. So my own involvement in this decade has been more importantly been involved with the X Prize. However, and the, I, I inserted the however, I think that the prize structure was too constrained, but the, it was inspirational to many, and it was a rallying cry that this should not be a governmental effort. So from 2008, what, so from 2008 was a pretty interesting period. Other teams besides Paul's, such as Astrobotic and Moon Express, have advanced their technologies on Earth and have given up the opportunity to send a payload to the moon despite the closing of the contest. The main reason why these smaller companies have been waiting to send their payloads to destinations in space is because of a fundamental change in the economics of space, brought about by launch companies such as SpaceX and the once more secretive Blue Origin. Sean Casey, principal of New Space Capital, talked of what defined these past 10 years in space. He felt that the industry included prominent high net worth individuals such as SpaceX Elon Musk and also CEO of electric car and energy company Tesla and Blue Origin's Jeff Bezos, who is also CEO of Amazon.com. He continued and expressed that the reason why these 10 years stand out is because of the high rise of high net worth individuals and their desire to impact this industry in a disruptive fashion. I think the industry is ripe for disruption, so it's disrupted by high net worth individuals and it's disrupted by individual entrepreneurs. Steve Wolf, deputy executor of the industry, industry conference in Houston called Spacecom, and author of the fictional book, The Obligation, drafted the, drafted the Space Settlement Act of 1998 as a young, young aide for Congressman George E. Brown, a Democrat of California. The essence of that bill was put into NASA authorization in 1988. It was the first time the term space settlement was used in public law. Wolf agreed with Casey's assessment of the current economic climate in a separate conversation. But with cheap access to space, we can expect, expect to see a Moore's Law effect, where the, the cost continues to come down, certainly, as a result of technological advancements, the reusability of rockets, but also the proliferation of the rocket systems that will create competition. More competition drives, drives, down, cost, drives down the cost even further. The more activities there are, the more opportunities, and I put in there are, to flight, and I put in then, the more system can evolve to even more the systems can evolve to even greater efficiency and to even greater cost savings. You create this continuous cycle of reducing the cost and improving the quality, like we've seen with the microprocessor field. Casey also has seen parallels between the computer industry and the emerging space industry, and he has determined that it has to do with economics. He said, I think you're waiting to see whether an ROI, return on investment, in, is in this sector. The Netscape moment was when Netscape had their IPO, initial public offering, and Microsoft was still trying to figure out why the internet was going to be big. Internet Explorer hadn't come out. Microsoft had left a ton of money on the table with investors saying, we don't understand why the sector is going to be big. That's the kind of precursor to this internet, to, to that internet moment. But on the other part of that is you have to have, you've got to have a really big exit. You have to impact the economy in a really significant fashion. You need to have a big ROI that makes it painfully obvious to investors that it's a good place for your money. 
New Space, within these past 10 years, has already made some money-making deals, but they do not have anything to do with launch vehicles, which were not sold to companies but raised lots of venture capital. Instead, these deals are involved with data from satellites put on these new rockets. Like Wolf's exp explanation of Moore's law of technology for smaller, more efficient products, as mentioned above, the satellite technology put on some parts of, of space is getting smaller and smaller. Two companies that work with satellite data and, ha and have made exits, two companies that work with satellite and ma made exits, Casey explained, the agriculture insurance company, cl the Climate Cor Corporation, that processed satellite data was sold to the publicly traded agricultural technology, technology company, Monsanto. In addition, the satellite company, Skybox, was sold later to publicly traded company, Google, which is then later resold. Casey speculated on some other exit with space companies, which included Los Angeles suborbital launch company Rocket Lab and small, and small sat California Bay Area companies Planet and Spire. Rocket Lab operates an orbital microsat launcher called Electron. Test flights for Electron began in May of 2017, and commercial flights began in November of 2018. New space may be a new concept with new opportunities, but space has always had a commercial side. I think entrepreneurial space has always been a topic for investors. It's it is that the question might be, why is it different this time, said Casey. One reason why it is different is that we've got a whole slew of technologies that have large economies of scales that haven't been applied in the space industry. And we also have an industry that hasn't been focused on the topic of reuse. So when you look at high-end individuals, every one of them from Musk to Bezos to Paul Allen to Richard Branson is focused on reuse and the costs associated with reuse. If we look at companies like Planet Spire, any of the other companies focused on the Internet of Things, imaging radar, they're applying technologies that have broad applicability throughout the economy, but they're applying it to the space sector and low Earth orbit. Knowing that new technologies have been passed over by established players, we know that established players have been focused on launch and reuse. Established players have been focused on the adoption of disruptive technologies, continued Casey. These established companies include Boeing, Lockheed Martin, and Northrop Grumman. In a separate conversation, Lindsay explained the first thing for the decade was SpaceX being su successful with the Falcon 9, which launched successfully in June 2010. A lot of people did not think they would get that far in the mainstream industry, said Lindsay. But then one project after another, they continued their success with reusable landings. The traditional space industry also includes its working with the government sector, which includes the military and NASA. Lindsay also thinks that the government se sector has been impressed with SpaceX and New Space. It's interesting to see how attitudes at NASA could change. SpaceX is now a client of NASA, bringing cargo to the International Space Station on a Falcon rocket with its own Dragon capsule, filled with supplies for astronauts and cosmonauts there. SpaceX is also a client of the US military and launches military satellites from its Falcon rockets. It took a t long time, like 10 years, for the Air Force to consider an alternative like SpaceX, said Lindsay. While SpaceX has not had a profitable exit or an IPO, it does have a large launch manifesto of companies and government organizations hiring the launch vehicle provider for its services. New space as a term may one day go away, as Lindsay suggested, and may simply be called space again. The traditional industry and the new space industry are crossing over more and more. Change in the United States is sweeping. Space lawyer Luigi Carminati space law, saw space law change in the past 10 years in the US and throughout the world in particular. It has changed culturally. There's much greater recognition that space law is a field. Although it's still considered off the beaten path and very atypical, there is a growing sense that space lawyers are helpful and useful. And that is because since there has been an explosion in, of the private, spec, private space endeavors, there is an increase in the need for lawyers that are not just regulatory, regulatory attorneys or government contracting attorneys. That is still is what is space law, but there's a lot more of it now. She also noted there has been massive changes in federal policy, with such congressional laws such as the Commercial Space Launch Act, which had been amended several times in the past 10 years. Congress has had several conversations on how to best regulate in the space in the United States. Those conversations were not just being held 15 to 20 years ago, she explained. 
The legal change globally is also apparent also, especially with governments. While France had for, for some time, India, Russia, and the Ukraine have come up with licensing and regulatory regimes for space for their countries. There is also a change in where more space in the world have their spacecraft launch. What was once purely found in the government sector, several new commercial spaceports have been approved by the Federal Aviation Administration. Besides Mojave Spaceport in California, there is Spaceport America in New Mexico, a spaceport in Midland, Texas, and a spaceport in Camden County, Georgia, among others. The concept of spacesuits is also being re recognized by the new space, re-examined rather, by the new space industry. Brooklyn, New York's Final Frontier Design and Midland, Texas Orbital Outfitters are trying to make astronaut work in space and on the moon and Mars more functional. Outside these two companies, however, there is little additional work in this area besides in academia. This may be a, represent a weak area within new space. However, other areas are growing. There is also an influx of new space incubators in the non-governmental organization promoting space business within their state. These organizations include Space Florida, Kentucky Space, Silicon Valley Space Center, and the New York Space Alliance. Casey has a leadership role in the last two organizations, being executive director of the Silicon Valley Space, Alliance, Space Consortium, hold on, the SVSC. There is even new space movement abroad in incubators in the United Kingdom and in Berlin, Germany. One new space pioneer has been in the industry for some time now. Jose Mariano Lopez Urdiales, a new space company owner based in Barcelona, Spain, is looking to send people on high altitude balloons with its balloon program. It's also looking to send small satellites to Earth's closest orbit, low Earth orbit, LEO, using a combination of balloons and rockets with its Blue Star program. His company is called Zero to Infinity. He said, the most important thing for me in the past decade has been the past decade has been my kids, but for me professionally and my company, the change in perception of new space to something that wasn't socially acceptable to, to a decent job or decent activity has changed. There's been a transition for the company and for myself as a new space founder from no credibility to some level of credibility and now a trend towards growth. It's had some hiccups, but, there's, but it's an enabling factor that allows everything else to happen. Hoyt Davison, managing partner of Near Earth LLC, echoed the growth felt by the new space industry, which he says has always been in space-related businesses. He believes that while typical growth for non-space companies may be up to 3%, growth in the industry can be 10 to 30% for decades. Davison said as more and more investors start exploring this, the more and more they become interested. Casey feels investing in space is a complex issue for companies and the public alike. He explained, we're in a situation where there's been a lot of pushback following the internet bubble on public offerings of companies and then regulation of companies. It can, be, it can be where we're creating an environment where the public doesn't have access to exciting corporate growth opportunities. Those opportunities are reserved for a limited investor pool. Of course, that's going to drive up costs of capital. There's a whole host of issues that are driving that discussion outside the new space sector. But the move towards new business, businesses rather, and a growth a growing move away from the government has defined not only the past 10 years, but some time before. Mark Fusco, a space consultant based in North Carolina, said, what has defined the past 10 years in space has been a growing movement towards privatization. Not just that, but finding new and profitable ways for NASA and other civil space agencies to work with and develop private companies to both increase competition and drive costs down. Welcome to the business of new space. Thank you. Um, really, that means a lot. Like, it took a lot to get that book out. So, thank you. <laughs> so, um, any questions? I think we're going to ask a question to you this month. <coughs> thank you. Um, for the new space movement and the big push. Is this on? Okay. For the new space movement and the big push to be able to get to Mars, do you think that the whole Mars uh, endeavor right now is more of a political fad or is it something that 
is a, an attainable and quantifiable goal for the next 10 years or so? 10 years, I don't know. But narrowing it down to 10 years is, is pretty tricky. There's been such, like with the new administration at least, there's been such a push to, to go to the moon. Um, I was a moon fan as a kid. Mm -hmm. I have since changed. <laughs> I've become more of a Mars fan. Um, and that's not that I've given up on the moon. It's just, just where, if you had to choose between the two, that's where I lean towards. And that's my personal preference. Um, but not, but um, it, it's because there's been, a, I should say it differently, because there's been a push towards the moon, there's, again, like the 10 years for the Mars, I, I don't think, in, in my opinion, is, is going to be really easy. Um, the thing is, you said it politically was the word I heard you use. That's why I think, I think people are going to ignore the government use and the politics and really try to do it on their own, which is what Elon Musk is doing, which for generations, like the Mars Society has been pushing. Bob Zuber. Yeah, yeah. exactly. So, um, so, and there's, he, he has a book, a great book. I read that book. Case for Mars. Yes. <laughs> so, um, more of like. It's, and there's like even covered in my book, there's a chapter, a chapter where I talked about one company that's working to build um, habitats on Mars through in C2, re in C2 resources. Um, that they're evolving on their own. Like the, the book sort of explains this too again. They're doing it by looking for money with projects here on Earth first before they even think about doing going to Mars, which is different from, which is interesting, is that it's different from the VC approach. They're not looking for venture capital, not that they won't take it, but they're not looking for venture capital and, and going that route. They're looking to be sustainable and waiting for the time to come that they could go to Mars. So there's, so there's company, companies out there have been doing that. That said, like, there's that company that I wrote about. After I wrote about them, sometime within the past year and a half, um, NASA had another Mars, Mars um, habitat challenge, and w the the winner from that blew many things out of out of the water. That from what I wrote about in this book, so um, so things are going to continue to. Go. I mean, politically, NASA was NASA was helping that happen for Mars, but um, but I think like we've reached a point where things are happening on its own, and that, like look, especially like we're, as an analyst for New Space Global, looking at the past two years, there's. Things are starting to, to take a shape on its own. That that like it's not it's not just about start, like I think that last quote from Jose um, in Barcelona. It's it's changed from just starting off, and there's been winners and losers with that start, but it's it's a change from it just starting off, and things are really starting to to happen. And progress is being made, and products and services are being bought and sold. All right, thank you. Yeah. Oh, hi. Um, so I'm curious, I'm, I'm relatively new to this space, but I've been very interested in, you know, satellite imagery and that. And I'm kind of curious, um, what are some of the consumer facing applications that the new space industry is going to be producing in, let's say, the next 10, 15 years that people are going to be using and are going to be saying, wow, this wasn't possible before we were able to go to space? Or are there applications like that that you know so of? I'm biased. My first degree is in space studies from the University of North Dakota, but my second degree is from Lehman College in geographic information science. And so um, I know a little bit about that, that field, which um, isn't combined too much with space all the time, data imagery. And also, like much like this, the satellite field, um, or even like, I'll just explain it this way. Even like the um, the um, astrophysicist uh, telescope telescope field and astrophysicists and planetary scientists, they use um, space satellites to do some of their research. Well, ground-based technology has proved to be proven better than what you put up on a satellite for some wavelengths. X-ray will always be up in space, but ground-based technology does prove out to be better. So the thing that I, when you mentioned data imagery, like there's satellites, but there's also drones. So you have to take that into consideration like for the future too. It's not like, if you're looking at just like, where is the data imagery gonna go from here? And it's what field? Are you talking about entertainment where you could use drones? I'm about to get married and we had a love story and they used a drone to, to fly us and take pictures of me and my fiance. I mean, that's one thing. If you're using it for agriculture, um, 
you could, in upstate New York, you could use drones or satellite imagery. I mean, and, or combine the, the data that you're getting from them. But like, is the the, the individual user, the the public consumer, going to be using that? In some ways, yes, and in some ways, no. It won't happen here in New York, for example, because um, satellite imagery in New York is is can only go up to a certain resolution due to Homeland Security. But if you were in upstate New York or out in the rest of the country or even maybe Jersey, that's a whole different scenario. So. As in you can get like higher resolution images out there? Yeah. Oh, okay. So you like, like even like, I think for Homeland Security, you can't even take pictures of Washington DC and stuff like that because it's the resolution has to, it won't be available to the public. So. What can, there's a lot, again, that changes things. There's a lot that can be done and will be done by people that get clearance and things like that. But, you know, it, it's, at the same time, there's a lot that, that, that will be lost. I mean, I worked for the health department doing GIS work here in New York City, and we, we couldn't use any satellite data imagery or drone imagery at all. So all of our, all of our data was, that's called raster data, when it's point lines and polygons that, that make up something, it's, it's vector data. And that's, we, we had good maps, but the, it was only on vector data. So does that answer your question? Oh yeah. <laughs> that's not most interested in satellite imagery. Like, but like, no, I know I'm in New Space NYC, but New York is not the place for satellite imagery. <laughs> so, like upstate New York would be like not New York City, but upstate New York. Yeah, yeah, in the Verizona Bridge, yeah, you can't, yeah, it's sad. <laughs> so, okay, um, my my question is, um, wh where do you see the the new space um, private space flight sector? going in the next 10 to 20 years, and if it's going to remain just for the access to the military and affluent tourists, or is there going to be an expansion of access? What, what do you think? Um, I don't have a crystal ball. Okay. Okay, I'm gonna, like, um, I don't want to put too much into it, too, because I think there are too many unknowns. Like I said, I think that the, the new space industry has grown a lot and has made lots of achievements and doing things with satellites and and even like the recent Starlink launch, we were, we were talking about this before before the, um, the we started filming. But um, that that's a game changer. But at the same time, um, like how the industry is going to change. I mean, there's 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 stuff coming from the biomedical industry that's affecting space, and there, which is in space we we would call human factors and things like that. There's so many other things than just satellites and space. Oh. That, that it's going to grow, but that, that also determines how fast it's going to grow. We thought that like people were going to be going to suborbital space really quickly. That didn't happen. And so, um, so yeah, it's like, but it's going to happen. That's, that's something I'm, I could say pretty confidently. Like, it just went. Okay. And, and okay, my, my other question is, uh, how many uh, startups are operating in the new space sector currently? And of these, which are the most innovative, the most uh, tail brazing? Oh, um, that's a good question. Um, at New Space Global, we track currently um, what used to be 900 companies, now 700 companies uh, around the world. Um, but um, um, what's the most innovative company? Uh, I like one that I brought up several times, was Made in Space. Um, I think um, they've done really well with their 3D printing. Um, they, they have, the I think, the longest 3D printed piece in the world um, in their offices. And, and one of the places that they're located, I can't remember which. I don't want to quote myself on that. So, um, but, um, but like I would say Made in Space is a really good innovator. I think um, uh, another one to watch, um, I'm trying to think. There's a, there's a lot, but. Um, but um, there's always like like uh, Rocket Lab, I would say is, but Rocket Lab is going to find a lot of competition. I think there's a lot of people in the launch vehicle provider industry um, that I think is going to give them uh, a good good race. Um, and then there's like SpaceX and Blue Origin, but um, yeah, um, but um, yeah, 
it's, it's a good question. I don't hope I answered it. L yeah. Real quick. <laughs> yes. I don't think anyone who gets a mic. Thank you. Um, I have a question regarding the 3D printing versus reusable launcher uh, debate, I guess. Um, what are the most interesting arguments you've heard on both sides? So either the SpaceX rocket lab approach or a relativity space or made in space approach. What's your take on that? Can you, can you give that to me again, the rocket lab approach or the what? Well, the reusable launcher right. versus just 3D printing a launcher. Use 3D printed disposable devices. Yeah. Well, I mean, like, I'm going to answer that through a segue, too. Um, like, uh, like, the whole point of CubeSats were, were being made, and one of the reasons why it, it was so attractive is that they could be disposable, like, that you didn't really have to worry about cost. It could just trickle down back to the earth, and, and you wouldn't have to worry about it, just burn up and there'd be no waste and, and it would do its mission successfully. Um, like, I'm not gonna pick a side in the debate. I mean, and, not, and that's not me being the media trying to be not biased, but um, I think, you know, if it works, then that's what's gonna work. Um, I don't think either side have proven, them, proven themselves completely. That's why I think there's like a, a debate um, and, and speculation. But, um, but I mean, I mean, SpaceX, for example, does both. Like, that's why I think you got to do whatever works. Because, like, SpaceX has reusable parts to their rockets, um, but they also have 3D printed parts to their rockets. So, I don't think it's... So, we're in between. Yeah, I mean, like, uh, that's an engine, like, thinking more on the lines of an engineer, you're trying to find the best hack and get, again, get if it works and then when you look at the final project is it sexy so <laughs> if you could do that you know i think you're you're pretty good hi thank you again for the talk um most of the companies that you've referenced they seem to be uh, all american companies i was wondering how is the status regarding uh foreign companies in this space and how do you think they match up to us right now Um, when I, even though I mentioned Jose, who's been in the industry for a long time in Barcelona, um, I think the most interesting area of the world that, that's progressing in space is China. Um, they're doing really, really well. Um, and they're doing it with businesses, not just solely, you know, with the, the government. Um, elsewhere in the world, um, I mean, the European Union has been doing like, and even like the UK has been doing like phenomenal. Um, there's a bunch of companies out of there. Um, I can't remember some of their names. I don't want to quote myself wrong, but um, especially in the UK, I'm thinking there. There's there's been a lot of like work there for a while, and they've been successful. They're they're, they're like the US companies that are starting to do contracts and and mergers and acquisitions and things like that. Canada too. Um, they they've been there's been a shuffle going on there with mergers and acquisitions. Um, and that, like, yeah, and I, again, I don't want to start quoting company names because I don't, I want to make sure that they're right. Um, but, um, but yeah, I think, um, but like going back to what I initially said, China is like, like, like a bunch of their companies, there's like three or four of them um, that have progressed a lot, like a lot, that, 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 it's not just at the U.S. Well, it's, it's it's mostly in the U.S., but it's not just the U.S. that's doing new space, or even space in general. Mm -hmm. It's Tanya. I have a question in regards to space mining. What is your outlook on that? Um, is there any type of realistic expectations um, in the um, near future? Yeah. Um, there's been some companies that, like I, I, in the book I talked about how like um, um, 
that the, the spacesuit industry is 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 not as robust as other other things like satellites or it, it, Earth imaging or um, or even building habitats to Mars, things like that, um, or even or the launch vehicle provider market, which is the biggest. Um, with asteroid mining, like the it's been waxing and waning, and like and like I said, like the 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 spacesuit industry, I think it, it needs a lot of work. Um, there's been a few companies. Um, again, no one's is really no one's really done it. Um, I think it, like it's important, for, especially if we're going to be using resources from space to continue growth in space. It's going to need to be done. Um, that said, like to be realistic, I think on the human factors end of everything, we have a whole lot more to do um, on figuring out how humans could live and operate in space. Um, before we even touch asteroid mining as an everyday thing, so. Oh, I had another question. Uh, what's with the obsession with going back to the moon and the militarization of space? Um, I don't know if there's an obsession with it. Um, I could be wrong. Um, again, like I look at things on the business side. So, I mean, the military, like I, I mentioned, the book is a client sometimes that asks for services. Um, Yeah, I don't think that um, I don't think um, I don't think I could really comment on that. Okay. But um, what is militarization? What was the other thing you said? Right. I don't think it's a bad idea. Again, like it's 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 Star Trek, Star Wars. Do you want to go to the moon or Mars? You know, <laughs> like it's. I mean. I think the space community, even though I'm a journalist, or not really a journalist, but a writer, I like to focus on that I'm a writer. I think a journalist would be a little more pressing with their questions. But, um, but um, I think that, uh, that, um, that the moon, be it the moon or Mars, um, that's important for us to, um, to find out how, like, find out how, like, again, going back to the human factors, how we could work and live in space and get something from it and create an economy. So, and it's it's going to take visionaries and, and things like that, but that's been happening with traditional space now and, and, and new space. Um, what is your thoughts on a space elevator, and is that something that is, like, actually viable right now, or people are working on that? Okay. Um... That's a good question. Um, there's always been talk of a space elevator. So, so to rule it out completely, you can't. Um, um, a lot of people say it's feasible. There, there are a bunch of companies, I think one's in Japan, that's working on that idea. Um, but sort of like with, earlier was mentioned with space junk, and is that a problem? That wasn't mentioned during the video, but like beforehand. Um, it's... It's something that's be, we're trying to solve. This or the space elevator concept is something that we're trying to, to prove, but um, but yeah, it's not been proven yet. Now, like again, like if you're trying to ask me, like should it be done or should it not be done? I don't know if I could say that because it's it's independent private companies that are doing these things that um, that are making the decisions to do it, no matter what I think. Well, I was more curious if it's something that people are actually pursuing nowadays or is people are pursuing it okay yeah. in your opinion for the past 10 years what would you consider the most defining technology that has brought us to where we are today in the new space I'm gonna steal it from one of the quotes from um, my book, I think it was Thomas Andrew Olson said in, in, in the introduction, um, and when SpaceX launched um, the Falcon Heavy, that was like the defining moment. It's so getting, the reusability aspect? Both the reusability, the, the large size, the, the most pow being at the most powerful launch vehicle, yeah, that's, that's the thing. Nice. So in 1967, the Outer Space Treaty was signed, and that basically made it such that when the United States puts the flag on the moon, that did not mean that the moon was American. Um, it prevents uh, 
governments from owning anything in space. And as far as I understand, um, it's rather ambiguous when it comes to private ownership. And now that we're in a place where private companies are able to go into space and have private initiatives, um, do you know of any companies that maybe have an interest in uh, claiming an asteroid for themselves or a piece of land for the purposes of business? Oh, I don't, I don't know that. I don't know that information. Anyone else? So do you plan to make another book in talking about space in the future? I don't know. That's a good question. Um, one of the things that, that, that um, enabled me to write the book is that I had the time to do it. Um, yeah, so it's, it's sort of if I get... I, and also how I would do it. Like, I, I don't know if I would write something more academic or something bigger and more dense or, um, yeah, something different. Um, that's, that's for me to decide in the future. But, yeah. Well, thank you again, everyone. It was really great talking to you. Um, uh, just you can find both books. It's 2008-2018, um, A New Space Primer by David Bullock. Uh, and then there is What is Up in Space, um, which is a kid's book and um, with really great pictures by Ronaldo Florendo from the Philippines. Um, and um, that's my, my bit on space. So um, thanks again. These books are being sold here for $10 each. Um, if you want to find them, you can find them on uh, Barnes and Nobles and Amazon. And a Kindle version for this book will be out soon. It's not ready yet, but this has a digital version on the Nook. Again, thanks. <laughs>